Welcome everyone to Interface Wears part one of four for our Did You Know webinar series, Doing More with Iguana. This topic is something many of you have requested additional information on, and we hope today's anticipated webinar is informative and will help you maxif maximize the use of Iguana and learn a few tips and tricks you didn't know that existed previously. My name is Prashant Sri, and I'm the Product Marketing Lead here at Interfaceware. In today's session, joining us, we have two Interfaceware staff members, Aaron, the sales engineer, and Leanne from our customer solutions team, answering all of your questions live throughout this webinar. At any time, we encourage anyone to ask a question using the Q&A box located within your Zoom window. No question is a bad question, and we'll do our very best to answer your inquiry in real time. The questions can be about today's presentation or about any iguana related questions you may have. Our presenter will also be doing a few anonymous polls throughout this presentation, so feel free to participate and provide your feedback. And as we normally do, we'll be sending out a post event recap email Monday morning, so look out for that in your inboxes with this recording and additional resources specific to today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, my colleague and our speaker today, Natalie Wiedenfield, one of our experienced sales engineers at Interfaceware since 2019. She is an expert in all things Iguana and has worked with a variety of our clients ensuring Iguana is used in the best way possible to solve interoperability challenges. She also has a master's degree in health informatics from the University of Toronto. A, full, a, a few cool things about Natalie is that her, in her free time, she loves to draw and paint and is a talented artist. Another cool thing I just learned was she went backpacking around the world for seven months and saw 14 countries right before joining Interfaceware back when the world was a little bit more normal. It's now my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Natalie today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Prashant. And welcome everyone to the first webinar of Interfaceware's Did You Know webinar series. So today I'll be introducing some of Iguana's lesser known features. And I'm going to show you some tips and tricks for using Iguana that is going to help you to optimize your usage and get you thinking about new ways that you can start to use your Iguana. So today we'll be covering quite a few topics, but we're going to be focusing on three overarching concepts. So we have Iguana configuration and administration, interface development, as well as solutions and workflows. So we're gonna start off by introducing some tools and strategies that you can use to optimize your Iguana installation process. Now, for many of you, the installation and configuration process is probably pretty familiar. You download Iguana according to our best practices. You apply your instance configurations, and then you go ahead and create your channels. And then you repeat this process for all other Iguana instances. Now, depending on the complexity of your interfaces and your architecture, installing and configuring Iguana can become a little bit tedious especially if you have tens or hundreds of iguanas with tens or hundreds of channels that you need to repeat this process for. But did you know that you can actually expedite this process by creating standalone pre-built and pre-configured iguana packages in an executable file? So when you install and configure your iguana, all of your data is stored in a set of directory files. So you have your application files, which stores information that's related to the Iguana application itself, such as the dashboard, being able to turn channels on and off, and so on. Then you have your configuration files, which contains all of your configuration settings, your environmental variables, and your external repository configurations. And you have your log files, which stores all of your logged Iguana interactions. So when you um, package these into an executable file, you're essentially packing up an entire Iguana instance, which means that you'll only need to build and configure a single instance of Iguana that you can then export to other servers. 
And this is especially useful if you need to deploy across applications with the same integration and configuration requirements, such as OEM applications, for example. And to illustrate this, we've actually created a proof of concept for deploying a pre-configured Fire Iguana on a virtual machine within an Azure Cloud environment. And in this case, Iguana was used as a web service for external applications to access healthcare information using a Fire-based API. So by wrapping Iguana up into an easily deployable and pre-built package, we were able to complete the additional configurations on Azure within about 10 minutes, and then deploy a fully provisioned Iguana instance capable of processing 1,000 Fire resources per second on a Fire server within about two hours. And these results are great, but they are also what you can normally expect from this type of deployment strategy. And very similar to this example, by creating a prepackaged Iguana, you'll be able to spend less time on development since you're only going to need to create your interfaces once. You can achieve a faster time to market with your instances due to the quick deployment process. And you can improve your scalability efforts through auto deployment by being able to deploy across multiple servers at a time. And in our Did You Know Administration webinar, we're going to take a deeper dive into other ways that you can create and leverage your pre-built Iguana packages and how you can actually go ahead and create these bundles yourself. Now, one of the final steps of the Iguana deployment process is to register and license your Iguana. So licensing is completed after the installation process and is a requisite for activating your instances. Now, the typical process for licensing includes activating a license from within your member's account, then copying the registration code provided, launching Iguana, and entering the license code manually. And this approach might not be too cumbersome if you need to do this for just a few instances, but what if you needed to activate 20 or 50 or 100 in instances at a time? You would probably want a way to automate this process. Well, did you know that you can activate your licenses programmatically via API? So with Iguana's license API, you can automatically activate new instances or transfer licenses from other instances that are no longer in use. And this can be especially useful if you have a fleet of Iguanas that need to have their licenses activated or transferred. So for example, during a migration process, or it can even be helpful in the event that one of your Iguana servers goes down and you need to get back up and running with your secondary or your redundant instances. And the nice part is that our clients can call this API through any external application, such as a .NET application, for example, meaning that you don't need another Iguana for this workflow. So you have complete flexibility of how you go ahead and access this API. And using a combination of RESTful API calls, you'll be able to access several license-based activities through this API, including getting an authorization token, which you're going to need to use with the rest of your API calls. You can get a list of your available license codes from your account. You can activate an Iguana license, which is also going to provide you with a license description. So whether or not it's a base professional or enterprise license, along with the license activation code. You can check to see if a license is activated and receive information about the Iguana instance that is currently using it. You can transfer a license from one Iguana to another by stating the activation ID of the Iguana that you're transferring from and the ID of the instance that you're transferring to. You can get details about an Iguana instance, including the instance ID, which is going to be needed if you're activating or transferring a license. And you can apply a license code to an Iguana instance by stating the license key that you want to apply. So ultimately, the license API allows you to dynamically activate Iguana without having to manually access the application itself. And this is just one way that's going to help you to not only speed up your deployment processes, but also provides greater security by limiting the potential of human error from manually working in Iguana. And as part of our upcoming administration webinar, we're going to take a look at how you can actually call this API externally, 
and talk a little bit more about each type of license-based activity. So before we move on to our next topic, we just wanted to take a quick poll here. So you should see a poll that um, has popped up on your screen right now. And we just wanted to get a sense of how many of you are currently managing your license activities manually versus programmatically. So we'll give you a few moments here to um, answer the poll. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask our support engineers who are currently taking your questions in the live Q&A section of this webinar. So we'll give everyone just a couple more seconds here. Okay, perfect. So thank you everybody so much for um, participating in the poll. So it looks like most of you are planning to um, manage your license activities manually, which is great. But maybe uh, you can also start to think about using this license API for some of those activities that you're currently managing manually. All right. So now at this point, we've introduced a couple of ways to help you accelerate your Iguana installation and activation processes. But what about your user base? You're still going to need to register your user accounts in order to access and work with your Iguana. So configuring user roles and permissions manually can also take a little bit of time to complete, especially if you have many users that need to be deployed across a fleet of Iguanas within your network. However, did you know that there is a quick and efficient way to synchronize your users across multiple servers? So by configuring your user accounts on a master Iguana server or the Iguana that you want to use as your source of truth, you can replicate and apply this configuration to all other Iguanas in your network, as long as those servers are running identical versions of Iguanas. So by synchronizing your users programmatically, you will save time for configuration since you're not going to need to recreate these settings manually for each instance. And in our Did You Know Administration webinar, we're going to show you how you can actually go ahead and synchronize your users and go through some of the important caveats to keep in mind during this process. So once you've activated your Iguana user base, you're ready to start working in Iguana and importing some channels. And one very common way to facilitate the channel import and export process is to store your channels within a repository. So the example that we have up right now is just a GitHub repository. And typically you would access these repositories by inputting a username and a password. However, password authentication often is not secure enough on its own, and it can be left open to multiple security risks, including things like brute force and phishing attacks. And if you do have a complicated or a randomly generated password, it can be difficult for users to remember, especially if they're not using it that frequently. But don't worry, did you know that Iguana can help to make your authentication process much more streamlined and secure by implementing an SSH workflow? So SSH tunnels are really gaining in popularity because they provide better data security, including for things like strong data encryption, user authentication, host authentication, and message authentication. And here we can see an example of what actually happens during the handshake process using SSH keys between an Iguana client and a server. So by setting up SSH integration in Iguana, you can use private keys for authentication instead of a username and password combination. And this is going to help you to strengthen your security standards by adding a layer of data encryption. And it's also going to provide you with a quick and easy way to access your repositories without having to rely on your memory to input usernames and passwords. And just as a side note, GitHub has also recently changed their authentication requirements for their platform. So as of August 13th, 2021, they'll be using SSH keys or token-based authentication for all of their authenticated Git processes, meaning that usernames and passwords are no longer going to be accepted as an access method. So if you would like to strengthen the security for your authentication protocols, 
and learn a little bit more about the changes to GitHub, please join us in our administration webinar where we're going to be going over some more tools and best practices for setting up SSH in Iguana and showing you how you can smoothly transition from username and password authentication to SSH authentication. Now, besides transitioning to using SSH protocols, you may also be looking to transition to a newer version of Iguana. So over the years, we've gone from Chameleon, which is a product that's embedded into other software, to Iguana, which is a standalone platform for transmitting and transforming messages. So upgrading your Iguana is a very important step in ensuring that you do maintain your business continuity and are up to par with the latest and greatest Iguana features, security updates, and integration trends. And those who are on legacy Iguana versions may want to take advantage of the newest Iguana tools and functionalities, but are hesitant to upgrade to the newest version due to the complexity of your current architecture. But did you know that there is a simple, painless, and no fuss way to upgrade your instance? Well, luckily there is. So upgrading from legacy Iguana versions to the latest Iguana 614 version is not difficult as long as you follow our best practice recommendations and considerations for the process. And this includes how to back up your legacy Iguana properly, which legacy files you should and should not copy over to your new instance, and how you can run Iguana safely for the first time after the upgrade. And by following our best practice upgrade procedures, you'll benefit from a clean upgrade process and be able to take advantage of the latest Iguana enhancements, improve your system stability, and be able to support your overall business growth. So join us in our administration webinar where we're going to introduce some important tips to keep in mind during the upgrade process, as well as talk about how this process differs for those looking to upgrade for Iguana 3, 4, and 5. So very similar to the upgrade process, the Iguana migration process can also be hassle-free by choosing the approach that works best for your organization. So when you migrate your Iguana instance to a new environment, it can have huge business implications. And that's why it's so important to make sure that your migration strategy is well thought out and planned. And did you know that depending on your business policies, you can choose between two approaches for your migration processes. The first approach is the Big Bang approach. And this is basically where you would have two environments and then you would migrate the existing interfaces to a new environment all at once during a period of downtime. And this is usually suitable for a migration of just a few channels. So something in the range of 10, maybe 20 or 30 channels. And then you also have the option of going with the staged approach where you would migrate your interfaces in small chunks as opposed to all at once. And in this approach, you would typically migrate your interfaces by category, which allows you to prioritize your stages. So if you have any interfaces that need to go live now, you could prioritize those first. So as an example, we usually categorize the interfaces and stage them in order of complexity. So your first stage would be where you move any of your new interfaces. And these will be the easiest to move and configure since they probably have recently undergone some various development and testing procedures. So you know exactly how they work and they can be planned to migrate more easily. The second stage is where you would move any of your one-off interfaces. So any interface that's built for a singular task. And these are typically moved second because they don't tend to have any dependencies, so they can also be migrated fairly easily. Your third stage is any pass-through interfaces, so anything that's just basically funneling data from one place to another. And these interfaces tend to have a few dependencies but are not overly complicated. And your last stage is your remaining and your complex interfaces. And these might have multiple steps with different translators, HTTPS components, web servers, and all that sort of stuff. And those are going to require a more thorough testing process after they've been migrated. So there are advantages to both of these approaches. The advantages of the Big Bang approach is that it is generally less costly since you're only going to need to incur the maintenance costs of a single system, meaning that your operating expenses will be lower. You'll also benefit from a faster return on investment since the process changes happen immediately. 
And it can be a less complicated option since you're not going to need to maintain any temporary systems or interfaces during the transition. And the advantages of the staged approach is that it can be less risky because it does allow for mid-course corrections if required. It's also easier to manage since you can also stage and prioritize your budget and your resources along with your migration phases. And you'll experience minimal downtime since you can keep your legacy and your new systems running in parallel until the migration is complete. So choosing the right approach is going to lead to a clean migration process that will allow you to reduce your system downtime and avoid any unnecessary challenges. And in our upcoming administration webinar, we're going to go through the technical requirements in Iguana for each approach, which is further going to help you to determine which approach makes business sense for your organization. Now, before we move into our next topic, we just wanted to take another quick survey. And just wanted to know that if you are planning to migrate your iguanas this year, which strategy are you leaning more towards? So please just take a quick moment to fill out this survey. So we'll give everyone a few more seconds here to fill it out. And as everyone is filling out that survey, uh, we are getting quite a few questions to the panelists uh, via chat, but I do encourage everyone just to ask your questions in the Q&A box located on the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, this way, if others have similar questions, they could see what you're asking as well. Great, thanks Prashant. All right, so thank you everybody for participating in the poll. So for anybody who is unsure about um, which migration strategy they are planning to use if you are migrating your iguanas this year, please reach out to us, to our support, or to your account managers um, after this webinar, and uh, we would love to help you out with um, helping you with creating your strategy for that. Okay. So moving on to configuration. So configuration management also plays a key role in the migration and upgrading processes. And when you deploy your channels between instances, or if you change your iguana environment, you may have some hard-coded variables in your translator that need to be updated. And these can include things such as your usernames and passwords, your database host and name configurations, and your file directory locations. And in this example, all of the values in red are hard-coded. So if I move this iguana to another environment, it would mean that I have to go back into this translator script and update these manually to match my new environment. However, did you know that these configurations, along with many others, can be done without actually needing to access the translator? And this can be done by using environmental variables. So environmental variables are essentially variables whose values are assigned outside of the translator. And in Iguana, you can access your list of environmental variables from the settings page in your Iguana instance. And to invoke an environmental variable, you just need to use the os.getenv function as is outlined in this example. And then when the channel is initiated, the reference to that variable name is going to be replaced with its assigned value. So therefore, if the value changes, then there's no need to go into your script and alter your source code or anything like that. The changes can just be made to the environmental variable itself. And by using environmental variables, users are not going to need to make changes within the translator, therefore limiting the risk of human error. And additionally, these variable settings are stored in the Iguana ENV file that's located in your Iguana working directory. So this makes it really easy to move and copy between instances and therefore helps to simplify the interface migration process. And in our administration webinar, we'll go through other use cases for environmental variables, which is further going to help you to simplify the migration experience and strengthen your configuration management strategies. So another common activity that you might encounter is troubleshooting and debugging your interfaces. And we all know that Interfaceware prides itself on delivering top-notch customer service to assist with any of these issues. 
But did you know that you can be proactive in streamlining the air handling, troubleshooting, and debugging processes directly in Iguana? So you might be happy to know that every instance has access to its own debugging dashboard. You just need to add forward slash debug to the end of your instance URL. And this is going to bring you to the debug page where you can access different tools for troubleshooting various issues. And a very common issue that you can begin to troubleshoot here is if you notice a decline in your Iguana, uh, Iguana's performance. And using this example, you'll want to check the first link that's on this debug page, which is log usage statistics. And this is going to bring you to this page where you can view your log stats and you can begin to narrow down the cause of any message issues or any issues that are related to crashes that you may experience. So some key things that you can check here are the date of issue to see if it coincides with the date of any changes that you made to your iguana or any changes that you made to the data that you're processing. The total log size to determine any spikes in message throughput or message size that could impact performance. The space remaining on the partition to see if there is enough space left for Iguana to run efficiently. The partition capacity to see how much total space is allocated for Iguana logs. And how many logs have been used per day. And if this number is close to the space remaining on the partition, it could be an indicator to decrease your log purge time so that you clean out your logs and avoid any performance issues. Now, another useful link on the debug page is the socket diagnostics. So if you've ever gotten the too many open sockets error in Iguana, this would be a great place to start troubleshooting. And this link shows all of these sockets that are used by Iguana. And in this example, it's only showing five open sockets, which typically would not cause Iguana to error out. But for example, if you were to see hundreds of sockets listed here, it could indicate that your sockets are not being closed properly. And that can mean that your socket timeout needs to be reduced. Or in the case that your system has extremely high transaction volumes, it could indicate that your processing activities should be split up across several Iguana servers. Now, another helpful tool for troubleshooting service issues is to take a look at your service error logs, and these can be found in your Iguana main repo. So in here, you can see the date and time of any issues by searching for the word error and then sorting through to analyze some more details about those issues. And these are just a couple of tools that you can use in Iguana that is going to help you to identify issues proactively so that you can find out about issues before your clients do. It will also help you to optimize your Iguana performance by allowing you to identify bottlenecks and hardware up, uh, update requirements. And you can restore your business productivity by preventing issues from escalating. So in our administration webinar, we're be, we'll be going into more uh, detail about these error resolution workflows and look at some additional tools that you can use to speed up your resolution processes. So now you're able to troubleshoot some of your Iguana performance issues on your own. But another key part to ensuring that your Iguana remains issue free is to also ensure that the data that's flowing through your instances remains secure. And working in the healthcare space or just working with sensitive data, we all know how important it is to meet data security requirements. And that's why Iguana offers built-in and industry standard algorithms to ensure that your data remains secure both at rest and in transit against unauthorized access or cyber attacks. But did you know that you can add an extra layer of security by applying a secure sockets layer or SSL security certificate to your web-based interfaces? So SSL is, as you may have guessed, a security protocol for servers and web browsers to make sure that data transactions between the two remain private. And in Iguana, there are two places where you can set up SSL. The first is in your web server settings. So Iguana has a built-in web server that's used by Iguana's interface. And by enabling HTTPS, Iguana is going to apply SSL to any of its web-based APIs. So for example, our log or our monitor API, as well as any changes that are made within the dashboard and any acknowledgements that you receive from the web server. And to enable support, it's very easy. 
First, you have to generate a public private key certificate, as well as a certificate file from a certificate authority. And then once you have your key and your certificate files, you can go ahead and input them here and then simply restart your web server to apply them. You can also set up SSL within the HTTPS channel settings. And this is going to allow you to set up a secure web service for two-way SSL authentication. And optionally, you can choose to verify peer, which is going to verify the server that is sending you messages. And then you also have the option to serve files from a directory. And this is useful if you have embedded content in your files, such as images. And if your interfaces are processing any patient health information or any other sensitive data, we do recommend applying these certificates to fully protect your data and comply with HIPAA standards and requirements. So now you've improved your data security in Iguana, which is pretty great, but wouldn't it be even better if you could maintain your security standards while expediting processes for password protected workflows? Well, there is a way to do it. Did you know that you can safely and securely bypass manual authorization and authentication processes by using a proxy server, or more specifically, a reverse proxy with single sign-on? And a reverse proxy is a common type of proxy server, which acts as a gateway between a client and a web server. So when a client makes a request to a web server, it hits the proxy first, which then forwards the request to one or more web servers and then delivers a response back to the client. And when you apply SSO to this workflow, the reverse proxy is integrated with an identity provider system, which is going to validate the users before it grants access to any of your internal systems. So this means that a user does not need to re-enter their access credentials each time that they make a request to a server. So therefore, your communication is going to become faster, more efficient, and also more secure since the request is not going to be completed until the user is properly authorized and authenticated. So by employing these security recommendations, you'll easily be able to meet security compliance requirements such as HIPAA. You can enhance your data security by ensuring that your data in transit is protected and you can expedite your workflows by implementing SSO and limiting the number of manual user logins. And in our administration webinar, we'll review in more detail how you can configure Iguana to implement these secure workflows within your own network architecture. Now, aside from data security, performance is also an important part of ensuring that your integrations remain in optimal condition. So performance testing provides users with information about Iguana's processing speed, its stability, and its scalability. And it can be used to indicate any changes that may be necessary for data processing improvements. And at Interfaceware, performance is always a top of mind concern, which is why we make sure to conduct thorough performance tests before each major Iguana version release. But did you know that you can conduct these performance tests internally with your own Iguana? So I want to actually provide some helpful features for conducting performance testing internally, such as determining how many messages per second are coming in through your interface, checking your CPU usage, and so on. And within Iguana's built-in repositories, you'll have access to channels that can assist with performance testing. So for example, you have the HL7 random message generator, which is going to create HL7 messages and send these to your downstream channels. And the functionality is very similar to the HL7 simulator, which comes with your Iguana installation, except this time it's in Iguana channel form. And this is helpful because this generator is based on translator functionality, meaning that you can code and change exactly how many messages you want to test. So for example, you can put through 500 messages a second or a thousand messages a second, or really any value that you need to test with. And you can also view stats at the channel level. So when you click on a channel, on the right-hand side, you'll see a bunch of information that can be really helpful for performance testing. So for example, how many messages have been queued, how many have been processed, and how many um, are, and also the speed of processing. 
So the metrics are going to help you to indicate how many messages can be processed within a certain amount of time for this channel. And additionally, if you click on the ellipses on the left side of your dashboard, so those three little dots in the middle of that red circle, you'll see this pop-out menu where you can also select to view your CPU usage, response time, memory usage, and so on. And these are all good things for administering Iguana, but also for justifying server hardware upgrades. So for example, if you select CPU usage here and then turn on all your channels, it's going to show you how much of your CPU is being used, and then you can adjust your hardware requirements accordingly. So by monitoring performance internally, you can be proactive in troubleshooting performance issues, adjusting your hardware requirements if needed, and avoiding performance bottlenecks. So in our administration webinar, we're going to review more Iguana tools and features that are going to help you to facilitate these internal performance testing workflows. Now, another way to ensure that your Iguana performance is optimized is to architect your integrations in a way that addresses your business requirements. So for example, your large file integrations can quickly create bottlenecks if they're not designed correctly. And did you know that there are industry tested interface designs, which you can use to optimize your interface architectures. And each of these designs serves a different purpose. And the design that you're going to choose is going to depend on the problem that you're trying to solve. So the first design example here is called the competing consumers design. And it's composed of a receiver channel, which receives and delegates messages to multiple downstream consumer channels. So you would use this design if you have messages that are arriving into your channels faster than they can be processed sequentially. And this can create bottlenecks. So for example, a very common workflow in which this design is used is in payment processing or in patient admission workflows. And this design helps to handle peak message volumes and is generally used when volumes are highly variable or when, mes or when messages are independent of each other and they can be processed in parallel or when your architecture needs to be highly available and remain resilient if a processing channel fails. Next, we have the content filter design, which is used when elements need to be removed from a message. So for example, removing sensitive data such as patient demographics for security purposes, so that you're only giving the downstream systems the information that they need. And this design is best used when your inbound messages contain large amounts of data that's not required by your downstream system. And this is the composed message processor design. So in this case, the processing channel is going to split up the message and then route these sub messages to the appropriate destinations for individual processing. And then it re-aggregates the responses back into a single message. So for example, you could use this design in a medication and device order workflow that involves different processing systems for different types of orders. And this is used when the order of results don't matter and the message consists of several components, each with their own processing requirements. So now these are just three of many different design patterns that you can use to architect your interfaces. But by implementing these designs according to your business needs, you'll be able to optimize message processing activities, leverage these solutions for any future design issues, and, and increase your solutions reliability. So in our developing interfaces webinar, we're going to go through more of these patterns in detail, as well as discuss the use cases for each and how they can be used to optimize your interface architecture. So now we've looked at various optimizations that you can make for your Iguana instances and your architectures, but there's also some things that you can optimize for your development processes. So now at this point, you may have been working in Iguana for a while and probably consider yourself a bit of a Lua expert. But did you know that there are some hidden Lua commands and functionalities that you can call from the translator? And the first hidden command is the underscore G command. So underscore G is essentially a Lua context table. But the special thing about underscore G is that the values within this table can be used across scripts within your current environment. 
So this means that you can create sh uh, shared or global variables that don't have to be redefined in every script. So how does this compare to a local variable? Well, if we look at the two, we can see that the local variable value is only going to apply to the current script, whereas the shared or the global variable value is going to apply the same value across multiple scripts. You can also use underscore G to pull up a list of all of the Iguana libraries and functions under it, as well as provide hints as to what can be done with each of those functions listed. So ultimately, this command makes it much easier to browse your Lua's functionality and is especially helpful for developers because it provides a way to store and manage your variables all in one place. And if you've ever developed an Iguana, you've probably created a few customized functions and modules within the translator, because after all, that is one of the big advantages of working within a script-based environment. But did you know that you can also create custom help documentation for any of those functions that you create. And this can be done by using the Lua help function and more specifically, the help.set function. And this is going to allow you to access and apply settings for things like your function's title, a description of your function, your function's use, and any required parameters. So anytime that you do create user-facing functions, you should define help documentation for them, since this is going to help your developers or other Iguana users understand the purpose of that function. And for anybody who's not using Iguana for development and is using Chameleon instead, you may be looking for a way to transition from Chameleon to the latest Iguana platform. But did you know that Iguana provides tools to assist specifically with this conversion? So here we have the CHM API, which is actually provided as a convenience for Chameleon users who are switching to the Iguana translator, and it provides several functionalities. So the first is the from XML function, which converts an HL7 XML string into an HL7 message. Next, we have the parse function, which is used to compare the output of your Chameleon interfaces to the equivalent Lua mapping code. And this command is going to parse and map your data according to your Chameleon VMD. And it's also going to help to execute any logic that's contained in your VMD files Python scripts. We also have the to XML function, which is the reverse function of the from XML function. And this is going to convert an HL7 message into an HL7 XML string. And lastly, we have the transform function which is going to provide a legacy transformation in Iguana similar to what you would have done using Chameleon. And it's meant to make it convenient to write code that compares the output of the equivalent Lua mapping code. So in summary, by using these hidden tools and commands, it can help you to improve your interface development and upgrade processes by providing programmatic ways to convert your legacy data as well as enhance your use of Iguana coding by allowing you to better organize your code as well as create documentation to use for knowledge transfer. And in our Developing Interfaces webinar, we're going to go into more depth on different use cases for these hidden commands and how you can actually go ahead and apply them in Iguana. So now many of you probably have started your Iguana journey based on the need to create HL7 based integrations. But as we've seen, there are many different data types and standards that are currently used within healthcare. And as a result, there are many specialized tools and products that have been developed to facilitate these different types of workflows. But did you know that you may not need a roster of different systems to accommodate this variety because Iguana can process so much more than just HL7? And in fact, Iguana has native processing capability as well as pre-built templates for all of these data types. And these templates include things like sample data, in-house parsers, and common processing logic. And that's going to give you a great starting point from which you can adjust and customize the code according to your specific integration requirements. So by having a single integration system that can ingest all of these data types, it means that all of your applications can connect to a central hub so that your monitoring, deployment, and your development processes are centralized 
and they can be more easily managed. So before we move on to our next topic, we just wanted to take one last quick survey here. And we just wanted to get a quick show of hands for how many of you are looking to expand your use of Iguana to support any additional data types. So we'll give you a few seconds here to go ahead and fill out this poll. Thanks to everyone for all those uh, engaging questions uh, coming in. Uh, we do have about 10, 15 minutes left. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask in the Q&A box. Perfect. All right. So it looks like quite a few of you would like to expand your use of Iguana. So as always, please feel free to reach out to your account manager and we can have a conversation about how you can go ahead and expand your use of Iguana. Okay, so now if you are using Iguana to ingest all of those various data types, the next thing you're going to need is a place to actually store that data. So for example, within a database. So let's take a look at some database optimizations that you can make. So integrating with databases is an extremely common use case for Iguana. And as an Iguana user, you may already be adept at developing your uh, database interfaces. But did you know that Iguana has several database connection tools that can enhance your database maintenance, security, and reliability strategies? So for example, rather than manually creating your database schema in Iguana, you can actually leverage our import database schema tool to upload your schema programmatically. So this module allows you to connect to your database by inputting your access credentials. So here you would input things such as your database name, your username, your password, and the API that you're using to connect. And it will output the table schemas of all of your tables within that database. So in this example, we have a patient and a physician table schema that I'm pulling from my database. You can then simply copy and paste that schema into a DBS file in your channel which can then be referenced and used to easily map values from your data inputs. So in this example, we're mapping HL7 data values to the database tables um, based on my DBS schema file. And this schema file is used in combination with our merge function, which allows you to merge all of your data into your database all at once. However, there are some best practice recommendations to keep in mind for inserting or merging data into your database tables. So rather than inserting directly into your application tables, Iguana can be used to merge this data into staging tables first. And a staging table acts as a temporary data store before any data is finalized and uploaded to your application tables. So this type of architecture provides an added layer of security so that data within your application table is not prematurely overwritten by data that Iguana updates or inserts into the database. And aside from allowing you to easily map and merge data into your database, Iguana also provides mechanisms for automatically retrying your connections. So for example, a single translator script could be used to make queries to your database 10 times to check for updates for a single message. And if you are following our best practice recommendations in which we do recommend closing your database connections, you're essentially opening and closing those connections each time that you query. So this can mean that you're opening and closing connections 10 times for a single message, which could begin to affect performance and cause slowdowns. So to prevent this from happening, we created the DB2 module. And DB2 is a database module that also has a built-in connection retry function. And its job is to keep the connection open because the actual act of opening and closing the connections is resource intensive. And that's what normally causes slowdowns for database integrations. And at its core, it's still using the standard DB module. However, this time there's a bunch of added functionality around it that makes it much more robust and reliable. 
You can also make DB2 into a database handle that can be used throughout your code. So now you'll have access to all of the existing functions that the regular DB module has, but with the enhancements of the DB2 module. So in summary, by using Iguana's database tools, you'll be able to improve your database maintenance, security, and reliability procedures. So please join us for our Developing Interfaces webinar, where we're going to show you other database tools that you can use to apply to your interfaces, as well as go through some best practice recommendations for using them. And lastly, we come to pre-built modules and templates. So many healthcare projects require integrating with systems like EMRs or cloud-based services, or even non-clinical applications. However, creating the tools to connect to these systems and defining the mapping structures can become a little bit tricky and time consuming. But did you know that Iguana provides several pre-built modules that allow you to quickly to connect to these services? So let's take a quick look at the different tools that Iguana offers to help you get up and running with your integrations quickly and efficiently. So each of these tools and modules are based on each system's respective implementation guides and they can help you to get about 40% of the way there for your interface connectivity and mapping development. So listed here are some of our supported vendor EMR templates. So for example, our Athena Health module allows you to easily connect to Athena Health's API and interact with its available resources. It also provides an easier and faster way to recognize the types of parameters that are needed in a web request along with its relevant description, and this module offers built-in help documentation to assist with developing your interfaces. But aside from Athena Health, we also provide pre-built templates for Epic, Allscripts, eClinicalWorks, Amazon S3, HL7 Fire, Smart on Fire, and Salesforce. So leveraging these templates is going to save you time and resources because you're not going to have to develop the connections or mapping structures from scratch which provides you with a way to cut down your interface implementation time. So in our solutions and workflows webinar, we'll be introducing more of these templates, as well as walk you through how each of these can be used within your business context. And that brings us to the end of the Did You Know introductory webinar. I hope you all learned something new about Iguana today, and we look forward to seeing you at our remaining uh, three webinars of the series where we're going to be going into more depth about solutions and workflows, Iguana administration and configuration, as well as interface development. So thank you all so much for joining today and we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was very insightful and a good way to kick off our Did You Know series. As Natalie mentioned, this is one part one of four uh, that we will be hosting in the coming months. Dates are yet to be determined, but some of the content that we will be covering will include solutions and workflows, uh, developing interfaces and administration. So a lot of insightful information to help you maximize Iguana for the beginner or the adept user. Uh, as well, at the end of this, uh, uh, webinar, we are going to have a, a very short survey that will pop up. Uh, your feedback is really critical. We really want to ensure that we are providing great content to you. And so please take 10 to 20 seconds just to fill out that survey. And we look forward to uh, uh, hosting you the next time. Please keep your eyes out for our post event email that will be coming out uh, Monday morning. But uh, if you do want the recording earlier or always want to reference to past webinars, feel free to go onto our interfaceware.com uh, forward slash resources in there. By filtering through webinars, you'll be able to get all access to all our webinars, all our resources, and our past recordings as well. So uh, on behalf of everyone from Interfaceware, uh, wishing you uh, continued success and hoping everyone continues to be safe. Thank you so much.